Hey, let's get into the word. Who's ready for a good word from God's word? I'll make it brief. I know we got a busy weekend. But let's, I'm going to give you an encouragement today, and I hope you enjoy it. And uh, let's just open our hearts to receive here today. I want to continue in the teaching series called Disciple, Walking in the Ways of Jesus. You know, you're a disciple. What does that mean? That you're, it means that you're disciplined and when we're talking about disciples of Jesus in his ways, we're disciplined in the ways of Jesus. We're supposed to learn to walk like Jesus, talk like him, think like him, act like him. If that's not what it's about for you, you signed up for the wrong thing. We want to be like Christ. To be a Christian means to be a Christ-like one. That we're Christ-like. Now, you're still unique in your personality and in, in, in the way you look and all those kinds of things. God, but God wants to express himself through your personality, your ways, but he wants you to hold his values, hold his thoughts, hold his worldview, hold his heart, to have a heart that's after him, that does things his ways. And so we started last week, and you can find the first uh, installment of this series we started last week, and I would love for you uh, to go and check that out on our YouTube channel. But today we're going to talk about trust is rest. Trust is rest. Father, I thank you for your power and your strength. There's no one like you. And Lord, here we are. We open our hearts to receive. We're going to sit at your feet and we're going to hear your word. We ask you to speak today to each one of us. Open your word to be fed. It's, it's, it's bread of life. It's living water to quench our thirst. So God, instruct us, lead us, and guide us. We want to know you more. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Amen. Life is an adventure. Ups and downs, all arounds. The great prophet Eminem said, a normal life is boring. I like that because some people say they're bored. And, you know, the thing is, and, and I've heard that actually a lot lately. Uh, I'm bored. I'm, I've heard people saying that. I mean, I, I can tell you in following Jesus and being in ministry for these years, I haven't had a bored day I can remember, really. Um, when, you're, when you're living a life for God, your life is full of adventure. Your life is full of, of good. And, yeah, there's, there's times where there's down moments and there's, there's ups and downs and all around. That's why we love roller coasters and things like that, because you don't know what turns come in and what, when you're going to go up and when you're going to go down. <laughs> it creates this adventure on the inside of you. And that's what it's like to walk in the ways of Jesus, as we talk about being a disciple of Christ. Is, and when we walk in the ways of Jesus, it's us learning how to uh, navigate the ups and downs and the all arounds and, and, and enjoy the life that he's given us. And so, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 is one of my favorite verses because it talks about this path that God's called us to. And here's how, what we know about this path that God's called us to. It says that we are God's handiwork. That means that you were created by God for God. Created in, in Christ Jesus, you were created to be in Christ. And if you have faith in Christ, you become a new creation. You are His son, His daughter to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so there's this path that God's called you to walk on, and he's already prepared ahead of time the good works for you to do. And so life becomes a lot about discovering. Last week when we had our graduates on stage here, and we prayed over all those graduating, um, we talked about the idea of discovering what God has for us to do rather than figuring out i got to figure out what God, what i got to do with my life. I mean, I don't know. When I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, I couldn't figure anything out. I mean, I, I was struggling. I'd try this, it didn't work. I'd try that, it didn't work. I'd try, even when something worked, it didn't feel right. And so, there are good works that God has already prepared for you and I to walk in. It's a perfect path. And this path is full of, and by the way, you say, well, what if I miss a step? Well, that's where grace comes in place, to get you back in step. His grace is sufficient for us. And that's what we talked about a lot last week, too, in the first part of the series. And so, 
but have you come to places as you're following Jesus and you're walking in the path that he's called you to where you just feel spent, tired, exhausted? Sometimes you're tired, but sometimes you're tired. You know, I'm tired. <laughs> it's different. And so, where you feel like you almost are running out of gas. And you could say, where do you mean? I don't know, in your, your soulish realm, your, <laughs> your will, your, your emotions. You're just feeling tired or exhausted. Maybe physically in your body, you're just feeling tired. Where you're walking along, you're doing the best you can, and you just feel kind of exhausted. Like you're running out of gas, it feels like at times. Has anybody been there recently? It's good to talk about this on a three-day weekend, everyone. School just ended. <laughs> I can remember one time, um, I must have been about 20, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're like me, but I'm one of those guys, I push my gas uh, tank to, th like, the red line, but then, like, under the red line, like, the deep red line, like, way under. And one time, I literally ran out of gas, but somehow it happened right in front of a gas station. I literally coasted into the pump. I look next to me, and there's this guy going, well done, man. That is nice. It's like, yeah, sometimes we, it happens, right? We just run out of gas. You're feeling exhausted. You're feeling spent. Road trips are one of my favorite things to do um, as, with my family, and even just, just with me and Christy or however. I love getting out on the road. One of my favorite parts of road trips is the rest stops, whether it's an actual rest stop or whether it's just a convenience store or whatever, a gas station. I mean, gas station food hits different when you are on a road trip. It just, it just feels right. It's good. Um, rest stops are one of my favorite uh, places to be. I love going out there. Uh, one of my favorite ones is when you're going north, you're going up to Flagstaff or one of those places, there's this one called Sunset Point. And so you're coming through the desert, you're going up the mountains, and our, our state's so beautiful in so many different ways, and you're going through, you're seeing the big saguaros, and you're in cliffs, and you're seeing yourself on the edge, you know, you're going through all this, and it always tells you, turn off your AC, man, it's hot here, you're going you're gonna to overheat your car, and so you're going through and doing all this stuff, and, and finally you get up on top of this mountain, it feels like, but really it's a as soon as you come up through this little cliff, you come up onto a plateau, and it's like you've reached a new level. It's just flatness all of a sudden in there, and there's, this rest stop is right there, as soon as you get up on top. And so that's one of the views from Sunset, sunset Point. Was, and I love just getting out, looking out. <laughs> you stretch your legs, you evaluate your car, you get per some perspective, you know, you review what your trip is and how your trip's going so far. You let your car cool down. You, you go pee. You go, you go to the bathroom, right? You just, um, and then, you know, those things are good. Do you take the rest stops in life? Because if not, you're hot, tired, need a break probably irritable. You probably got to pee, you know. It's those kinds of things. You might be running out of gas. You know, Jesus taught us a lot of things, but one of the things when we're walking, because we're talking about walking in the ways of Jesus, that I've learned most from is how to live life according to the Jesus rhythm, the Jesus ways, how he walked, how he operated, his, his rhythms, his ways of doing things, his timing. You know, music is a lot about timing, isn't it? And rhythm is as much, hear this, rhythm is as much about the stops as it is the starts. Rhythm's as much about where there's nothing as much as where there's something. Otherwise, it's just noise. You're just, ah, stop. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's moments where you, you know, you even say, take a beat. Where you stop for a minute, you rest, you relax, you take care of you for a minute. You let God take care of you. And there's a whole bunch of reasons that we do this. And, you know, it's just, for instance, like margin. If you open, I don't know about you, if I go to open a book, 
and I see it's got tiny letters, and it's from one end of the page to the other, and from the top to the bottom, I don't care how good the book is, I shut that book. I'm like, no, that doesn't make sense. It does not compute to my brain. I like nice large print. I like nice large print. I like margin. <laughs> I, like, I like to feel like I'm making some progress. And, you know, our, our brains were meant to work that way, with starts and stops, with, with progress, but then pause. One of my favorite professors when I was training for ministry taught me that when you're teaching, when you're preaching, pause has meaning. So use pauses. Because sometimes just in the silence, you'll find of some of what you're looking for. Some of you are exhausted and tired and you haven't taken a rest off in years. And you're wondering, why is my life not good? <laughs> you know, why am I depressed? Anxiety in the heart of man presses him down. Anxiety. Think of it. That's what it says in Proverbs. Anxiety in the heart of man presses him down. So depression comes from anxiousness. Anxiety has its root in fear. Some of you can't take the rest stop because you don't know how to let go. I don't know how to stop. I don't know how to let go. I don't know how to to make this all work together. Jesus taught us some of this. And here's the good news. Uh, if it's been a while since you've taken a rest stop, I want you to know that there's another one coming up. You ever done that before? You're like, I meant to take that rest stop, and it's like, hey, you just missed it. But there's another one coming up. Like, yes. Yeah. Sometimes it says 40 miles down the road, but you're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I had to go to the bathroom pretty bad, but I'll wait. But there is another one coming up. God, by his grace, always has a path to get you where you need to get from here, wherever here is, even if it was a misstep or a misturn or, or whatever it might be. And Jesus taught us some of this in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This is the Sabbath. It's a, it's a, <laughs> the Sabbath is, is one of the commandments, the ten big ones, guys. It's actually up there, I think, before murder and other things. It's like up there, it's high. You say, well, what's the Sabbath you're talking about? Well, y y you work, and then you don't work. And then you work again, and then you don't work. And some of us think, today, I'm, not, I'm talking about something that's more than a vacation, more than you just uh, uh, taking a, a week off here or there. I'm talking about a lifestyle in which there's margin, in which there's rhythm, in which you find rest for your soul. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are wearied and heavy laden and burdened. And he said this, he said, I'll give you rest. I venture to say that's why you're here today is because you're looking for rest for your soul. You're looking for guidance, you're looking for direction, you're looking for peace. You're looking for some of the things that you need that you know only God can give. And that's a good thing. And so Jesus said, I, I've come, and, and, and in that verse, if we could shoot that back up real quick, he says that he made the Sabbath that was made for us. That means it's a gift. <laughs> God literally made a day of rest for us, and he gifted it to us. And what do we say with it? I mean, for many of us in our culture, day and age, the only time you remember that there's a Sabbath is when you go to Chick-fil-A on Sunday. Because here's the thing, they ain't open. And I can tell you this, I always want Chick-fil-A on Sunday. Can anybody resonate with this idea? <laughs> Why? I pull up, and I've got my, like, like the sugar-free lemonade that I love and everything, and I'm like, man, that's what I want. Nope. And, but the Sabbath was made for us. It's a gift. God, you know, rest is something that the Scripture talks about that we have to enter into. There is days where we, look, you, you need a day that's different than the other days. You need every week. You say some weeks. Christy showed me a verse I love because it said, in the plowing season, still have your Sabbath, your rest. 
find rest in the plowing season, and, which means you're out there doing the work. And then it said find rest in the harvest season. When you're, you're like, hey, this is great, I'm on vacation, you find rest then. But you got to find rest in both places. One of the places that we can start is by taking rest in our week, in our weekly schedule. There's got to be a day in your week where you decide, I am not going to work today. I'm not going to do anything else today. I'm going to focus on a few things that are family. Many times what I find in Sabbath is that Sabbath days are days to focus on relationship. All that we're working for, all that we do during the week, all that we take care of during the week, is there so that we can have those things and then take those those things into relationships that we have with other people and then enjoy it in that context. God literally said it's not good for man to be alone. And so we need to enter into those relationships. And this, this Sabbath day where you pick one day and you say, this is my day where I'm giving it to God. And it's not for you to be real super crazy busy and all this kind of stuff. For me and Christy, ours, because Sunday is kind of a work day for me and Christy. Um, so, so Monday is our day of rest. And on that day, it looks different. But then we have even different times and seasons and things. That we'll talk about a little bit about this. But, you know, for instance... We'll have other rhythms and things. Some of us, we don't know how to stop working ever. Um, we're always on, always text messaging, always checking emails, always looking at your phone first thing in the morning when you wake up, and it keeps you on in a perpetual state of work. That is unhealthy for your soul. That is unhealthy for your soul. We have to have pause, stop. I have, I don't care what is going on, I have a, 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 it's a personal principle that I've implemented that I do not go to my phone until a specific time in the morning. And what I use, I don't even use my phone, I use my iPad because I know it's not going to blow up with all these messages. And I use my iPad for my online Bible, all that kind of stuff, so I spend a little time with God or whatever else I need to do, but I don't go to my emails first thing. You ain't getting the first word in edgewise into my day. <laughs> right? I ain't going to give that to, to old Ted over there at work. He's going to give me some, here's a word for your day. You blew it over here. You need to do this and that. No, give God the first part of your day. Even if it's five minutes. Even if it's turn the radio off on your way to work because you're running late. I don't care where it is. You can find some time every day. And there's rest in that. There's rhythm in that. Some of us, we don't enter into Sabbath, which is a gift for us. We don't enter into it because we wonder, what's going to happen if I let go? <laughs> as if, as if you and I are holding everything together. As if somehow, some way, we're going to make it, make it happen. Resting is one of the greatest acts of faith that you can do. Because when you rest, you let go of all that you're trying to control, all that you're trying to get done, all that you're trying to do yourself. And you let go of it, you walk away from it, and you say, God, I know I was holding the universe together and making it run. Like, I, I, it was me. I was, I was doing it. So I think we might have a little too large or high of a view of ourselves <laughs> because we say, how could I ever take a break? My company will fold if I go somewhere. No, you know what? They were probably there, but they'll probably be there after you. I mean, God's been running the show for a long time. I mean, some of us, it's hard to take a break from the kids even. You got to. You say, How? I don't know, but you better figure it out. You better save some money for it or your marriage will pay for it. Uh, the best thing you can do for your kids is have a great marriage. That's the best thing you can do for your kids. 
You say, well, I want to, you know, I want to pour into our kids and we'll go to all the events and we'll do all the stuff and all the sports. We'll just keep pouring out into them and never take any time for us. And by the way, you are one with your spouse. So sometimes we need that pause, that rhythm in some of our certain specific relationships. <laughs> Resting is an act of faith. It's kind of like this. If you guys ever seen, remember those little, uh, those little finger traps? The first time I was a little kid, I put that on, and then I pulled out, and I'm like, ah, what? I, can't, I can't get my fingers out. There's no way to get, I'm stuck. Because the harder that you try, the more you get stuck. What's the only way to remove your hand from that? You got to. You push it, and real slowly and easily. <laughs> yeah, you, you, there's some pause there. There's, some, there's a different measure of timing and rhythm in the midst of that. And so Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17 says, He, somebody say he. Say it again, say he. He is before all things. Somebody say not me. Now say he again. He is before all things. Before you get to work Monday, he's there. Before you get home at night and, and engage you in your family relationships, he's there. And in him, somebody say him. And in him, all things hold together. Not in you and I, not in our capacity to do all this stuff and make it all work together. But it's Christ and Christ alone that is holding all things together in your life. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like good news. That I can, somebody should just exhale, right? I got all this I'm trying to accomplish and do. I got this pressure on me. I'm trying to make the finances work. I'm trying to find uh, the, the success and f fulfill my God-given destiny, build the business, uh, do the dream, uh, get through college, try to get the house all the things, do a ministry God's calls you to. I want you to know today that He is before all things, and by Him, all things are held together. And what that does is it gives us the, the, the permission to let go. Now, even when we're not Sabbathing, <laughs> if you will, there's still a mentality of rest that we can follow, allow to follow. It doesn't mean that you take away diligence. Because diligence is another biblical principle. Earls, we talk about this, and I talk about it with our family. We work hard. Like, we work hard. We're going to grind. But then at the same time, we're going to know the times of rest. This is what the scripture has taught us. And then we're going to know how the times that you just need to, you know, for instance, you get things on the calendar. You put some things there, some moments of rest and pause where you get away. I find that if you don't actually write it down and pause and actually take time for that, you don't, you don't do it. That's what I found. Your schedule seemingly will take care of you if you let it, or you can get ahead of it. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 38, here's Jesus again, and, he sa and it says that Jesus and his disciples were on their way, and he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. That's the key moment there in that verse, in this passage. There were two sisters. One was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Now, here's the thing. She was doing something good. That is a good thing. The problem was that she was distracted by it. What was she distracted from? And who is the word? That's Jesus. There was a literal Jesus in her home. <laughs> and I care about the china, and you might even care more about setting out the nice plates and the nice stuff when Jesus is coming over. On the other hand, when Jesus is talking, the living, breathing word of God the son of the living God, the one who it says, by the worlds, he fashioned them. 
He was there before it was created, and by him they were created. This is Jesus, and he has a few things to say, and he's in your house. And so Mary just decided, you know what, I'm going to come park right there by him. And it says that she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Anytime Jesus says your name twice in a row, that's not a good thing. That's not a good day. Martha, Martha. Or (laughs) Paul, Paul. (laughs) That's not a good thing. And the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. Let me ask you, and can you be honest and make some self-inventory? And I'm not trying to talk you into this if this isn't where you live. Because you are at peace with Jesus. Some of you are more Mary than Martha. And I don't think that what Martha was doing, again, was a bad thing. She just needed to find her perspective. She needed to not be distracted with what she was doing. To let that become her God. Some of us, it's not about, I think one of the things that Martha was distracted about was impressing other people. And some of us are so focused on impressing others around us that everything has to be perfect, and we all battle it. I battle it. Yesterday, I'm taking pictures at a graduation party, having fun. The guy's like, hey, throw this wig on, too. And it was like a fun picture. I'm like, do you know how much time I spent on my hair? And I'm up doing pictures. He's like, I got you. I feel you. I'll leave you alone. (laughs) But, you know, but there's that idea that, that, it it's can't be so much that we're focused on everyone else. It, it seems like that that has the capacity, when we're so consumed with impressing those around us, that has the capacity to steal rest from us, to steal pause from us, to, uh, to let us blow by the rest stop. There's a nice rest stop right there. You need it, but pfft, I got to go. I got places to go, people to see. I got things to do. I'm holding it together. Yet in Scripture, it says that he is holding it all together. Even when you let it go, he's still holding it together. And, um, but look at what he says. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better. So how many things are needed? So he's saying, here's what Jesus is saying here to, to Martha, she says, there's a lot of things in life that are, that are important. That's fine. But there's one thing that's absolutely necessary. He's talking a big perspective. There's one thing that's absolutely necessary. And Mary has chosen what is better, and it's not going to be taken away from her. And so what is that one thing? Where was Mary parked? At the feet of Jesus. You have a heart that's open and ears that are open. You're listening. You're, so what does it mean to be at the feet of Jesus? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> Number one, it means it's a place to receive, not to give. Some of us are so consumed with pouring out, and that's a good thing. If you're a parent, you pour out. You pour out. Bottom line. Wherever you're working or building, your own, leading your own business, you're pouring out. You're giving out. You're in a marriage, you give out. <laughs> that's it. You're... you're you, and I, and I believe everybody here today in some way, whether some of you are in sports teams and things, that you pour out. Any job you're working, you're pouring out. Coming to the feet of Jesus is where you get filled up. Some of you have not yet found the perfect vacation. It doesn't matter how much money you spend. Some of us agree with that, right? It's like I've been on really expensive vacations that weren't that great. I, I actually needed, the, you know, the vacation from the vacation kind of deal. But Jesus tells us to come and park at his feet. And when you say, how do you, how do you, how do you sit at the feet of Jesus? It's when you open God's word, when you have a heart to listen. I believe even when you practice silence, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Sometimes it's okay not to have any noise, even audible noise. And just be. Where are, we are in our culture day and age is we are doing something at all times. We have to have something incoming at all times. And a lot of times it just adds more weight to what we're dealing with. 
internally. And we wonder why our soul's not right. We wonder why we're not mentally well. Why are we mentally sick? We're not, we're not going. Sit in, it says Elijah, Elijah in the scriptures, God brought him out to a place and it said he saw an earthquake, wind, and a fire and all these big signs that God showed him. And then it says that he heard right after that, after God wasn't in any of those big things that wows out there, he heard a still small voice. And that's God's voice. And many of you are wondering, I need to hear God. Let me give you a key to that. Go be quiet somewhere. Maybe what some of you are looking for is a little more boredom. Be bored for a minute and be okay with it. Get with God. And that, just turning your attention. Sometimes Christy and I, uh, we have different levels of, of closeness and intimacy in marriage. That's what's what happens. Uh, and so the Word is a place you go to. When I say the Word, I mean the Scriptures. You open your Bible. You read your Scriptures. There's lots of ways to do that. There's devotionals, promise books. There's, you can spend longer times of study in there. But then sometimes Christy and I are on a road trip, like I was talking about earlier. And we're not just in there the whole time, just blah, 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 just talk, 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 nonstop, nonstop. Sometimes there's an hour or two that goes by. And we're just with each other and aware of each other. And that's us being together. And that's good. Same thing with you and God. Sometimes it's all right just to be aware of him. Number two. When you are at Jesus' feet, you're in a place of peace. Just don't. I'm okay knowing that you got me. I don't understand it all. But your presence in my life tells me everything's going to be all right. And if I have you, I have all that I need. And in that awareness, in that, in that place of being at Jesus' feet, and is, is the, the old song says, the things of this world grow strangely dim. Everything around you kind of fades to black. And you're able to see what's most important. Number one, Him. And then the other things he wants you to see that's more important is the relationships in your life, your marriage, your kids, your church family, your extended family, your people that matter in your life, the relationships that count. And some of those things will start to come into perspective too. Number three, <laughs> this sounds, this sounds kind of, <laughs> I don't know, it sounds kind of, duh, you're with him. I think it was Jeremiah that said, surely, surely God was in this place, but I wasn't aware of it. I didn't know. You know, when you come into worship and, and you know, and Taylor and the team, and Mike and the guys, and, and Brian, and everybody, and John, and, and Benny, and all of Tabby, yeah, all the guys, everybody's up here singing, and we're all up here wait, praising and worship and singing the songs. Sometimes in that moment, you feel like, oh man, I was in God's presence. I have a thought about that. You mean God wasn't with you before that? Or did you become all of a sudden more aware of it when you turned your attention to Jesus? And this is good news because that means we can have that experience. It's not the lights, it's not the show, it's not the things. And we purposely don't make it too big here at Valley Chapel on purpose say, why? It's about his presence. Can lights and all that interfere? I just don't want to train the people of our church that you have to be dependent on those things in order to enter into that place of God's presence and his peace and have an awareness of him. You can have that any day, any time. That same presence you experience in worship here, or in time when we're studying the word together, when you feel that at church, when you feel that, that's why you're here. You feel that, right? I feel it. You feel it. It's because we're more aware of it. Martha was distracted with her life and the to-do lists of life and being tired and getting things done and impressing other people. And it distracted her from her main purpose, the one thing that's needful. And don't beat yourself up over that, by the way. If that's you, join the club. We are all battling that. It's not going to help if you beat yourself up over it. Remember, another rest stop's on the way. 
just take the next rest stop. Here's one of my favorite pictures of all time of one of my favorite rest stops. Some of you say, like, take a vacation or a time away. It's got to be all this money, and just, i got to spend all this money. And I, I, some of you might even be saying, you know, I don't know if I can plan a vacation time. It always costs money. I don't have to cost much any money at all. This was one day after school, I think. I, I, it was maybe a half day or something, and I grabbed the kids and Christy, and I said, we're going to Chandler Mall. We're going to watch a movie. And I just turned and snapped this picture on, I think, my Blackberry. That's why it was a little bit fuzzy. <laughs> one of my favorite days. Didn't cost much. There's rest stops all around us, and we need that. We need those rest, those rest stops. Put them on your calendar if they're not. If you don't have a vacation, I don't care if you take a vacation to the movie theater. I don't care if you take a vacation wherever it is. Somehow, some way, you got to find a way to get away and spend some time with your fam, but also with God. Maybe make some time in there where you've got, because I do believe those are important. I remember this guy in a commercial. He was an auto dealer. His name was Lou Grubb. I don't think his, the Lou Grubb dealerships are around anymore. But uh, the old school Arizona people remember. And um, he's had this. It was just so funny because he said, hey, he said, hey, it, it, he said, look, studies have shown that we are grumpy and we are stressed and we're not thinking right before lunch. So he said, I want you to go out today. And this, this commercial, I remember listening to it. It was maybe 9 or 10 a.m. He said, I want you to go have a great lunch. And then after that, I want you to come to Lou Grubb dealership and buy a car. I've always remembered that commercial. Do you remember? That's great. Because, because then that's what we're doing. We're like, man, uh, you're like, I love Jesus. But then let your face show that. Can your face show it? <laughs> because it doesn't look like you love Jesus and you want to invite me into this great life that like... <laughs> eat lunch, like, uh, just go take the rest stop. And then you go invite people into a place, and you're, you're like, no, no, I have all sorts of trials and tribulations. You mean following Jesus isn't about a perfect life? Oh, no, not at all. It's just he's there with me every step of the way, and he always sees me through it, whatever I go through. Lastly, uh, when you went to, you, you might have heard this before, but it, it really, really sat right with me the first time I heard it, because this is not my way of, of operating. You're in a flight, they're giving you the instructions, the stewardesses say, if you have a baby on your lap, I know you're not going to want to, but you put your oxygen mask on yourself first, then you can put the oxygen mask on your child. But some of us say, no, no, I don't know, I'm just going to put it on my kids. Well, by mom, by dad, there's a sudden loss in cabin pressure because you can't, you're not going to be right. So, so what is he saying there? There's a, there's a process. And some of us, the one thing I do like about this generation, maybe take it too far, some of the ways that we've tried to straighten ourselves out. This does mean you need to, lungs breathe out, but they breathe in. And there are no awards given for not being there. Some of you, it's to the point that you're so stressed and you're working so hard and you're, you're so worried and whatever is going on in your life, you're taking care of others so much, you're just not even physically well. So that's why it says you got to put the mask on yourself and then you'll be more capable to help everyone else around you. So even it says this, uh, Jesus said we should love others as we love ourselves. So there is a matter of you following the Jesus ways and rhythms of taking care of yourself so that you can pour out into others' lives. Now, that doesn't mean that we are the center of the universe because we're not going to go sit down and look at ourselves. We're going to go sit down and look at Jesus, amen? We're going to see him. That's the difference between the world's version of self-care what God says. Amen.
I would love for you to close your heads and bow your eyes with me. Father, we thank you for your presence in our lives, and there's many of us here today that are wearied and we're tired. We have been trying hard. We didn't mean to become more like Martha than Mary, but we have been. God, help us. Help us to live a Sabbath lifestyle where we work hard, but we know when it's time to rest and to stop, to take the rest stop, to be like you, Lord. You had moments you pull away with your, to be with your Father, places where you were alone just to hear his voice. God, I ask that you would help all of us at Valley Chapel live that kind of life and be that kind of disciple of Christ. That we have lives that our others look into and see joy. That others look into and see in the midst of even troubled circumstances, they still see peace. Help us to live that way. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you don't know Jesus, or maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ, today's the day, now's the time for you to give your life over to Jesus. So if you need to do that, I'm going to lead the whole entire congregation in a prayer. But if you need to put your faith and trust in Him, I want you to pray this prayer with the faith that you have. The scripture says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so today I ask you to call on the name of the Lord. You don't have to have all your questions about God answered. You don't have to know everything about what's ahead. You don't have to become a member of this church. But you do have to put your faith in the Son of God. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. That's what Jesus said. And so we invite you into life today. That when you take your last breath here, you have the promise that your next breath will be with God in heaven. I'd like everybody to repeat this prayer after me. And you just say it and mean it from your heart with the faith that you have. Everybody say, dear God. Everybody say, dear God. I come before you today, a sinner. I ask you, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I believe you are the Son of God, and I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Believe someone came to the Lord today, amen. Praise God. God's good.